how you doing well so we are we were going to be recording with someone else tonight um but they've had a bit of a plumbing emergency so we thought let's do our coffee chat now so yeah. how are you guys i'm good you know it's it's monday it's um usually we do these on thursday so it's awesome to have a early week coffee chat but i feel good i feel like the energy of the world right now is pretty exciting or maybe it's just me i don't know how are you how's your kitty well, how's your good. Kitty? I mean, yeah. I've had, yeah it's lovely doing it on monday because i've had a really different weekend this weekend we took um friday off all of us took for my family took friday off we went for a really gorgeous long walk and had a pub lunch which is a very british thing to do so we went for like a 10 kilometer walk all across country to this lovely pub and then saturday I went to, it's my friend Andrea's birthday and her girlfriend Nat. So we went down to Brighton and had a lovely lunch out with them and saw them and had such good fun. So it's been a really, really lovely weekend. And obviously I've got my new cat who I've just put inside. She's been out here. It, Idris is sitting there reclaiming his favourite spot. So it's really good. But amongst all that, of course, you've got your inner world haven't you in terms of what's going on sort of within yourself and in your immediate vicinity and then you've got all the other stuff so yeah. it's it's been a really great time of reflection to me i've been putting into practice a lot of what you and i've been talking about about the meditation about the reflection about there's a few things that have cropped up this week that have really triggered me and looking at you know okay what's this trying to teach me mm -hmm. why am i reacting what is it that's really um unresolved for me to actually feel i've got to react to this yes yeah and that's been huge for me too because we know um that we cannot control everything that happens in the exterior and the outside world um, the only thing we can control is our own self and our own reaction to that experience. And, you know, it's kind of like we talked about last week. And, and I think as we talk about this, it's for us as well. Like we're not, you know, I've said this before, kind of one of the jokes about philosophy teachers is we, we teach what we need to learn the most, you know, it's, it's talking this through because this is uh, one of my teachers used to call this the unsolvable riddle. Like, how do you experience your emotions, your triggers, but also learn from them enough to understand that they're just an attachment to an illusion. It's, it's just mind blowing to actually contemplate that. But the best we can do is focus on our inner world. And you and I have really been focusing on that. I think both on, on both of our channels and together about, you know, if you can't change what's happening outside of you, you can change what's happening inside of you. And if we all did that, if we all took the time to really engage in what we call pratyahara, um, self-study, then I think where we want to be collectively will come a lot faster than it is. It does that makes like does that makes like if we're all right. looking in the mirror, you know? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it's so true because I've been involved in lots of conversations over the last week, as I'm sure every single person watching this has, about the Russia-Ukraine situation. I won't say those words too many times. And the thing is, it's like we said, everyone, it's like assholes. Everyone's got an opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, most of us do not know at the moment how right or wrong our opinion is. There's so many probably other options that haven't even been discussed that could be happening there. So people think it's this or it's this or, it, you know, um, you know, he's good, he's bad. And so we've spoken about that. And what I what's really hit home to me, actually, over probably about well, really since the Ukraine situations happened is I thought, wow. I've got to stop focusing on other people and what they think, but because I'm seeing a reflection that I don't think that most of humanity has learned anything over the last two years. Now, of course, that's just my perception of how I'm seeing people react to things. And therefore, I'm just thinking, okay, enough. Time to really just concentrate on myself and by that i don't mean i'm not going to have conversations with people like you mm -hmm. because i love learning but i've got to it's got to not be about other people because yeah. if we're dependent on anyone whether it's our husband whether it's our neighbor whether it's our children whether it's a world leader that's outside our control yeah and that's the whole point i think that's the whole point of this great awakening is that um we can't we can't hand our power away, you know? And, and also when something goes wrong, 
you and you get mad at somebody else for something going wrong, that's also handing your power away. You know what I'm saying? It's not that people don't need to, you know, be vindicated or have some sort of justice, but it's almost like we're at this point where we still haven't learned to let go of the matrix in the sense that we need a leader or we need somebody to do this for us, or it's only true if this person says it, or if it's only true if that person says it. And we're forgetting to take that power back ourselves. Because the whole thing that we know about, like we have the higher self, that's our higher selves. Our higher selves already know everything that's going to happen. Our higher selves are aware of everything. It's our lower selves that are idiots that don't know anything. And so, but if we learn to like settle into that and know that everything is going as it's supposed to, whether that's good or bad or however you perceive that, we can start to then take that power back ourselves and start to work on our own um, experience in this timeline, because that's what it's about. And I know that there's panic. I know people are panicked right now. I understand it. And there's, there's, there's something interesting about the human body. And I think this happens with the human brain too. So, you know, I, I'm involved in heavy exercise, a very extreme yoga uh, practice. I also do other things too. And I see it in myself and I see it in my students that right before the body is on the precipice of change. So right before there's a breakthrough in the body, right before someone gets that leg behind their head or is able to do a drop back into a back bend, the body panics. And so the body pulls back. And so that's when the person's the most sore, the most emotional. And it's because the body knows that it's about to enter into a territory that it doesn't know, that it's not familiar with. And so it rather sit back in the area it knows for sure, instead of venture into this new territory. Well, I think the same thing happens with our psyches as well. Well, actually, I know it does because the body's the minefield. And it's almost like and you, you see this re repetitive with people, like instead of taking a chance and healing and going into a new place that's unfamiliar, they'd rather stay in the toxic cycle because they know it. And so I think yeah. that's happening collectively. We're still acting out behaviors that we were taught in the matrix of, of relying on a ruling elite, on relying on a celebrity, on relying on somebody else to tell us what to do versus venturing into this new territory where we only rely on ourselves. And it's that's so great. important. And I think you and I are also talking in various conversations off camera that that also links into... Um, really understanding yourself and understanding what you personally stand for because one of the things I think we both experienced and again probably lots of other people have as well is a lot of people can be very on their soapbox I stand for this I'm going to stand up for that until it either involves hitting them in their own pocket mm -hmm. <laughs> or they're making some, you know, quite difficult change in their life. Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of, on a micro level, um, a lot of people um, demonstrating quite a lot of hypocrisy and saying, that, yeah, I stand for this, I stand for justice, I stand for this, as long as it doesn't affect my decisions. You know, I can do it because I'm talking about something that's far away that doesn't directly involve me at the moment. Yeah. But actually, how am I acting out and behaving on my day-to-day -day decisions, on my day-to-day -day way that I'm living my life, the way I'm speaking to people, the way I'm spending my money, are they in line with my core values or not? Absolutely. And if, if they're not, then we're no, no better than the virtue signaler, signalers on the other side. You know, exactly. it's, it's um, I, the last episode I did with Sean Stone, which we're going to be filming with him later. Um, he said something genius, like if, if you don't um, agree with the matrix, then why are you still shopping at certain coffee shops? I won't say the name exactly. of them. You know, you have to start it and it's going to make you uncomfortable. Like change is always uncomfortable, but it changes never for a lot of people that, 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 that friction of change can be, can, can be non, not pleasant. If you've ever done a detox, you know how unpleasant that can be for a while. Right. But it brings you to a new place. And so, um, so yeah, it's, and at the end of the day, it, it is that man in the mirror. It's what are, you got to start with you, you know, and, and what is it? True character is how you behave when nobody else is looking. Absolutely. And I think this is why, you know, a lot of the stuff, as you were saying that, you know, the teacher teaches what they most need to learn. So part of the stuff why we're having this series on meditation, I'm doing my manifestation one is because you and I have found this so um, instrumental in terms of how we cope with trying to stop getting drawn into things when we see ourselves. And I do, you know, I see myself getting drawn into things, but I catch it a lot quicker these days. Yeah. And also I then know what to do about it. When I'm seeing my sort of reactivity levels go up, I know what I can do that works for me. So for me, 
it is either a bit doing a meditation or getting out and walking the dogs or walking the horses or of course cuddling a cat but yeah you find what works for you as an individual and that can take some time to build up can't it yeah there's a great book i was actually telling our friend stephanie this morning there's a great book of course written by ram Dass. I, you you would think i was one of his publicists even though he's no longer with us but i really just really ram Dass is one of my favorite teachers ever and it's called polishing the mirror and it's it's his own story um, but the, the first time I read it, I, I cried my way through it because he talks a lot about this. Um, he talks a lot about uh, being able to observe your emotions, being able to be, that's a power move. If you, I'm, I'm kind of on this kick of power moves, you know, yes. so many times we get swept up into our emotions, right? To the point where it's all, you know, that expression seeing red when you're mad, like that's all you can be in is this vibration of whatever emotion it is, be it good or bad. And part of your power move as a living, breathing soul is to be able to feel that emotion, but know it's just an emotion. Mm. and observe it as interesting and then you start when you start to be able to do that according to like yogic philosophy you start to bring power away from the ego and you're bringing it back to the humility of the soul you know and i think i think if um and this again is for me too i have to catch myself in this all the time because i'm super emotional you know i have to be able to sit back and it's so hard it's so hard when someone pisses you off or there's been some injustice done for you to say like okay I just have to settle into this and just let it be. I'm feeling this emotion right now because of cause and effect of what happened. It's just an emotion. It's just a thought. It's going to pass, but I need to focus on myself. But it also goes back into this too, which we see it a lot. And you know, like 20 year olds get into this, but there are 30 and 40 year olds that get to this as well, where, where we're, we're basing our, our inner happiness on somebody else. We see this a lot yeah. with love relationships. Like you're never going to be happy in a relationship until you're actually able to love yourself, until you're actually able to be happy by yourself. Then you can come into a healthy place within a relationship as well. And so you think about that with your relationship to the outside world and to your own nature nature. You have to be able to observe. And that power move is like you said, going, ah, I see this. I see when this is coming. I can spot this coming instead of just living in that emotion and projecting it out of you. I hope that makes sense. This, I know this is all kind and of, one of the questions, philosophy, but yeah, no, it's really does. And one of the things that I was having an interesting discussion with someone about at the weekend was about how that links in to boundaries and not allowing yourself to be gaslit or walked all over. And actually, I think for me personally, it works perfectly with boundaries because when you've got control, you recognize your own emotions and you've got tools and techniques in place to bring them under control. It's so much easier not to get walked all over, isn't it? And to yeah. stay in your boundaries and what you feel comfortable and not, not accept people projecting their shit on you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, also when you start noticing when you're doing that to people, then you can ha have a healthy way of stopping other people doing that to you as well, because you start to recognize patterns. Human beings, we live in patterns. Nature lives in patterns. That's the, that's the easiest thing for our brain to recognize is a freaking pattern. And also, you know, when you put up boundaries, if you're in, if you're with somebody who's toxic, they're not going to respect those boundaries. So you have to learn how to sta establish those boundaries for yourself and understand that toxic people will give pushback to your boundaries and that's okay. And that's a, a healthy friendship. A healthy person will respect when you put a boundary up and will back off. It's like, um, with everything I've been through these last three months, I've just now made it a rule on my channel that when we have Stephanie on that, we're not going to ask about anybody else in the re tarot readings. It's just going to be about yeah. yourself. And that's because I realized that because of what a happened to me like that wasn't cool that's not cool it's not cool to channel someone or look at their natal chart without their permission like that's not cool it doesn't feel good and so so we're so because i can recognize the issues that cause for me and the pain that caused for me i'm not going to inflict that on somebody else regardless of whether i know them or not and so now we've established that rule that's a boundary now that we're, we're only going to take questions that pertain to you and how it can help how the tarot cards can assist you in your growth you know and and hopefully that will help people shift Instead of looking in somebody else's backyard to see what they're doing, looking in your own backyard and therefore true healing can happen. True healing can't happen through somebody else. You can have a great therapist, a great healer. That's a conduit. But the person who has to do the work is you. It's you. Yeah. And, and finding sort of who resonates you if you need to, to sort of help you on that journey is really, really important. And I think 
most people that are watching this over the last couple of years, they're really working out what the balance is right for them mm -hmm. in terms of listening and, and being aware of external information. And you and I, both in our respective areas, we love researching. We mm -hmm. just love it. Um, so, you know, that's something that gives me a lot of energy, gives me a lot of joy. It really keeps me sort of ticking over nicely. Um, but equally, you've got to balance all about balance about, OK, I'm looking externally at certain things and I've got to balance that with my own inner work, because it's very, very easy to sort of get particularly with what we've all been discovering over the last couple of years to focus your intention on what's wrong in the world, what's wrong with other people yeah. without doing the inner work. And I think I am noticing a lot of people, certainly in our audiences, are really recognizing that and really you know, stepping up that balance. Yeah, it's so exciting to see people getting all excited about meditation and doing their own healing. And that is going to bring up, you know, it's not, you know, when you go for healing, the scary thing is it is going to bring about the dark night of the soul. There are, there is going to be an ego death and those are not fun to go through. It takes a very brave person to be able to stop looking into somebody else's backyard and to look at their own self. That takes bravery and courage and guts. But you are brave and you are strong and you're not a coward. And so I, I, it's exciting to see so many people rediscovering themselves. You know, if we all were able to settle into our spirit and our vibration of who we really are, instead of focused on somebody else, then this world would be such an incredible place. And we can all do that. It's, it's not unattainable. It's absolutely attainable. We can all do that. And when you start stepping into this, so let's take meditation, because it's one of the themes of, you know, what we were going to be talking about today, both here, but also with um, when we're talking, going to be talking to Sean Stone later in the week now. For me personally, you know, we talked about before, I think I've been playing at meditation for years and years. But when I really decided to make a practice of it, a consistent practice of it, everything changed yeah. and suddenly I can almost remember I mean for me the biggest breakthrough I had was at the first um, one day Joe Dispenser seminar that I went to and it was a really interesting day because I bought my husband's ticket for his Christmas present he really didn't want to go but I really wanted him to get into it because I thought it would really help him but unfortunately at that time I had a really dear friend who's no longer with us but because she was had a, a very serious illness and she was coming along with us and it was really important to her, my husband knew he had to be on his best behaviour and take it seriously. So he went into the room, sort of poo-pooing it all, and was completely blown away and a changed person when he walked out the room yeah. because he sat there and he saw just how amazing Joe Dispenser was in real life and how, um, you know, none of them was scripted. He didn't read from any presentation. It was all off the cuff. And then most importantly was sitting down and doing it and, and being guided through by an expert. And he just got it straight away because he's really good at quietening his mind. Mm -hmm. And what we've done so far, and it's been, it was really helpful for me because then when he was on board, we were able to carve out time together not, not even if we did the meditations together, but that to, to really keep ourselves accountable that, yes, this is really important and we are going to make a consistent practice of it. And I can honestly say that since we've done that, everything in my life has changed. Everything, the connection with the animals, the connection with other people, the connection with myself, the connection with nature, and a lot of the other fun things that you and I talk about, you know, the telepathy and things like that, all these other hidden parts of our brains and abilities start able to show themselves don't they yeah we in yoga we call those the siddhis they come out in the third and fourth pada which i'm technically not supposed to be talking about but i'm going to talk about anyway because i can do what i want because i'm an adult i'm just kidding uh, but uh the cities yeah that's um so what tends to happen what you what we learn about the ego is not only does the ego or the false sense of self make you more pompous and more fear-based, but the ego also hides things from you. It hides yes. things that you don't know you can do. And only until that ego death starts to happen, do you realize that there is a whole other side of your consciousness that the ego itself was hiding. Um, and that is one of the telepathy, the heightened intuition that is part of the Siddhis of the third and fourth pot of there's more Siddhis. There's like levitation is a Siddhi um, being able to make uh, things appear like consciously create like two apples out of one is a Siddhi. I can't do that. I've read stories of people who can, but 
that's a cool city to have. But, um, you know, so all these things that deal with like how you start to understand your own consciousness, because we know like consciousness is not really this hardcore matter. It's constantly moving and changing. And so if you learn how to be the, the master of your own consciousness, then you can, you can start to tap into the side of your own spiritual life that the ego before then had blocked off. I mean, you think about children, uh, children see things that adults don't see and that doesn't freak them out. It's because the ego isn't really there yet. It starts to build over time. And I love that he had such an experience. I was, we were talking about this on the phone and I think a lot of people don't really understand what the term guru means. And I know that there are a lot of people that take advantage of the term guru. All a guru really is, is like someone who's mastered a part of a teaching. And I was telling you that in India, at least like we know the guru can heighten the, because they've mastered this to a point themselves, doesn't mean they're perfect. doesn't mean you should lionize them. It doesn't mean they should be on a pedestal, but they've mastered this, this craft, whichever one it is, whatever form of meditation it is to a certain point that they can hold a certain vibration consciously hold a certain element of vibration for the student so that the student can experience a potential that they have. And so they have that marker. So then when they leave the guru and practice on their own, they have more of an ability to, to recreate that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah perfectly and it's a really really important point because I think this is where you start to see the real teachers break away from the sort of more amateur ones because there's only a certain level and any level of teaching you can get unless you've really Mm -hmm. embodied that skill yourself now I don't mean say if you're a tennis coach some some sports coaches can be absolutely brilliant coaches Mm -hmm. without physically being able to do it but they've studied it so much they understand the swing they understand the technique they understand how the mind and body works together so and whatever level of it is you have to be sort of quite at a master level and then you can even be at a master level but not be able to explain it to other people that is a different skill and on top of that to actually be able to teach that to other people successfully, as you say, hold that vibration. And it's also, you know, the guru, the master teacher's role is to also be able to notice you as the student to your blind spots. That's yeah. why in, in true in true spiritual form, you have to have a teacher. It's called parampara. You have to have a teacher because otherwise, if your blind spots are not being managed, you're going to go off into like crazyville. You know, because it's no, there's not going to be somebody there to manage what you what you're actually working through, and the ego then has the per- propensity to grow even bigger because that teacher isn't there to like keep you on your path. Now the teacher isn't doing the work for you. It's like my teacher in India. If we're in the Mysore room and someone does a handstand when they're not supposed to, he goes and pushes them over. Like, stop using your ego, pushes them over. Like, don't do this. You know, that humility, keeping that humility there in, in, in your practice or in whatever practice it is, whether it's asana or meditation, whatever, you know, keeping you in that straight and narrow. And that's, that's, the, 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 that's really, really important um, that you have someone, whether it's um, someone like Joe Dispenza, where you go one time or it's someone you're following or something that you have something to help you understand the complexity of who you are. And yeah, again, I want to, I wanted to say that the guru, again, I'm going to say this again, is not someone for you to lionize. Don't lionize anyone. And a good guru would not allow you to lionize them. They would put a boundary up when it, that's a good guru would, would definitely put a boundary up and say, no, 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 no. This is about you. I'm here for you. You're the star, not me. You are, I'm here to help you. And all the, all the gurus that you see, all the master teachers you see, guess what? They have a teacher too. They have exactly. else too. So it's all of us keeping each other accountable, but not stepping into each other's way as far as how one grows. So it's, it's, it's so it's, you know, when you get into these deep spiritual practices, regardless of whether, because the form of a meditation I practice is, is the Tristana method. So my meditation is very different from what you see other people doing, which we can talk about in a later date. Um, but that is what works for me because my, I am, my dosha is Vata, it's air. And so my, I do have the propensity to overthink. I do have the propensity to put myself in a place of anxiety or, or just exhausting a thought. And so the Tristana method works for me in, in order to get the mind to focus on something else so it can calm itself down. But, um, but yeah, it's, 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 um, it's interesting and it's fun when you start to, to 
I mean, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it sucks when you realize you're kind of an asshole and you need to, you need to fix that. So, um, but you know, it, it really is very rewarding after you go on a long journey, isn't it? Cause you just change so much, so much about you changes. Oh, and you find out so much about yourself that you didn't even know on the way. And I think it's a really important thing that you said about the meditation and we've spoken about it before. There's so many different types and that none of them are better or worse than another. Different things will meditate, will, will resonate with you at different times. So you might want to start off with one method and then you might progress on to another. But when I mean progress, I mean just because you're at a stage where you're looking for something different, not in terms of hierarchical progression. Yeah. And I think that's evolution. It is literally just natural evolution. And it's really, really important that, you, you know, to drop the comparison side of things yeah. because you know just because someone else might sit there you uh, sitting there for six hours a day hours a day meditating isn't necessarily better than sitting there for half an hour a day no. it depends what you need at that time and there's a purpose for all extremes and it also depends on where you live in the world so this is an ayurvedic trick so i live in the middle of a city i'm smack dab in the middle of 6 million people, like literally living on top of each other. And so for me, a city, because of the lights and the sounds and the noise and the energy is considered vata, which is what I naturally am anyway. There's lots of lights, there's lots of sounds, there's lots of like derangement going on. And so one of the laws of Ayurveda, which is the sister science to yoga, is, um, is that you cannot be as pure as your external world. You have to be in balance and harmony. And so for someone like myself, meditating for two, three, four hours a day, sitting on a meditation. So a pillow would end up causing me to go into Vata derangement because of my external world. But someone like Catherine, because she lives in the beautiful country, she has more of um, a ability to sit quietly longer because it matches her outside world. Does, I That's hope that like, point. it's, it's so it's when you start to look at the Ayurveda of energy, not energy works you're like, Oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. It's like, if you live in the city of London and you were a strict raw vegan, you would probably have some more health issues than someone who lived where Catherine is and is a strict raw yeah. vegan. You know, Catherine and I are both vegetarians, and, but, but I always laugh with my students. I'm like, yeah, because you live in a city, that means you get to go have a beer every now and again because you have to, you can't be as pure as your environment, you know, because you have to keep yourself in that balance. Um, and that's something that's super, super interesting. So therefore, it is going to be different literally for every person, depending on where they are. You know, there is, I was just looking at my candle here, I have a little sage candle. There is a meditation that's super simple, where all you do is for like 10 minutes, you just watch a flicker of light. That's all you do for 10 minutes, something simple like that and see what, see, see the calmness that comes over your mind. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be something as elaborate as, as, uh, the Tristana method, like I do, or sitting for three hours or, you know, um, there's one in one of Ram Dass books, he talks about going to this meditation retreat where they would have to sit up so straight that one of the proprietors would like whack them with a stick. If they started to slant, to, to slouch or slant, slant over, it doesn't have to be that extreme guys. He actually laughed about it. Like I didn't need to do that, you know, but, but you know, it can be something super simple as just looking at a flickering flame for 10 minutes, start there. You know, I did a zoom the other night with some, some girls and I taught them the om chanting. I, we did the, um, om Ganaka, om Ganaka, excuse me, om Ganapataye Nama, the Ganesha Chanta. And then we, uh, then we just did just a simple om and all you need is five minutes and that starts you on your journey. So yeah, everything, everybody's different. Every stage of life is different. Everybody's physical, mental placement in life right now are different. And so you have to meet yourself where you are, not where somebody else is. Yeah. And that makes such sense about the environment because we've spoken quite a lot before about us all being energy and, you know, the tuning forks, just you put, set off one tuning fork and the other tuning fork has to match the vibration. So it will either come down or up, depending on what its starting point was. So if you're an environment, every environment's got a certain vibration. And so it might be more challenging for you, depending on your personality type. And that's where it's really important to recognize, recognize when there's the resistance, recognize when there's the blocks and look at do you want to do something about that and making realizing that there's so much about our lives that we can actually change so even if you can't say you're a country bumpkin like me and you want more life force and you want to go out and live in a city 
well, if you can't go and move house, then perhaps you can go and spend one day a week there or something. It's looking at what you can do and having that mindset of, okay, what am I missing? What feels out of alignment for me? What are my options to do something about it? Yeah, absolutely. Take your power back. Stop being the victim. Take your power back. I told uh, an episode with Shanti, I, I was in, um, I was engaged in my early thirties to a man who was very abusive. And I actually almost lost my life one night. I got strangled and I was talking about everything that happened after that. And I did go through trauma therapy and I look back at that now. And even though people would label that as like, Oh, that's awful. That's horrible. It was one of the greatest gifts the universe ever gave me because it forced me. It forced me to have to change. It forced me to have to go deeper into my own work to heal from yeah. that and to figure out why I'd attracted that. And so, and so, yeah, it, every obstacle you have, whether you're living somewhere you don't want to live or you're, you can't, you're stuck because your city's still like super into this, you know, narrative of, you know, the, the virus that seems to have gone away overnight, but you know, what is this opportunity teaching me and how, what can I do to transform it? That's as, as our friend Shanti says, that's the power of alchemy. It's taking the lead and changing it into gold and you have that power and only you, only you can do that for yourself. Nobody else can do that for you. Only you can. And that's scary, but that's also a huge power move that you have that power. It's so lovely to go through that. And acceptance is such a big part of that. As you said, you know, you, you can't move on until you accept where you are and accept where you are. There's a big difference between guilt and judgment and actually full acceptance. What have I attracted into my life? Um, you know, I tend to have a giggle about it because I can have been through stages of my life where it's taken me a little bit longer than it should have <laughs> to learn the lesson. And now I look back and now I think that was all perfect because mm -hmm. I did need that extra lesson. Without it, I hadn't really internalized what the lesson was. I sort of got it at an intellectual level, but I hadn't internalized and transmuted it. So exactly. I think accepting where you are is so so important and when you do that you're off and running aren't you yeah and i want to you brought up something interesting that i just want to head on to the difference between guilt and shame mm -hmm. guilt and shame are two totally different things and if you've made a mistake in your life if you've done something that you regret sometimes people get stuck in this hamster wheel of shame shame is all encompassing for the whole physical being and I think you can look at someone you love or care about, family or friend, and if they do something wrong and it hurts your feelings, you know, you still love that person because, you know, it was the action that was wrong. That's when the guilt, that's where the guilt comes from, but the shame. And so a lot of times I think we get stuck in our own habitual patterns because we get stuck in the sense of shame that because we did something wrong or because something bad happened in our life that we might have caused, we are now bad. No, it was just one action that was misaligned. And once you realize that, you become so liberated and so free to then course correct and understand that you're not that. You're not that obstacle. You can use that to transmute it into gold. And so I would encourage people to, to get out of the shame, understand guilt is guilt for a reason, but shame is different. And no one should be ashamed of being a human being because we're all enough. And we all, you know, we all have guilt, but, but shame is something that's different. And so that, yeah, I like that you said that the whole like things like learning. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. and we always joke about learning from our animals. And you saw Idris arrive here, who's in here now. Idris, what did you do today? So this is a perfect example. So we've got my new cat, Mitzi, who's in a separate room, and they're sniffing through the bars. And when I brought Mitzi out into the office here, and he went into the room she's been in, did you spray? Did you spray urine all over her room to mark it as yours, Idris? He's wagging his tail. He doesn't feel any shame or guilt. <laughs> territory and does this look like a cat that's feeling any shame or guilt no or guilt. no he's like in my house well actually quite so i think that's a nice way to end it, it's we joke about animals teach us so much but he's like you know i'm king of the roost now this is my thing i'm going to go and spread urine all over my son's room <laughs> where the cat is sorry joe i promised it wouldn't happen but it has um um so, you know uh, so as idris isn't feeling guilty about it i won't either
Yeah, so. <laughs> just it is what it is. Yes, do not be ashamed of yourself. If you've done something bad, recognize it as a separate action, course correct. And if you've done something that you're regret and you're guilt for, you can course correct and transmute that lead to, to gold anyway. And so it's it's not at that point, it's not a mistake anymore, but a valuable tool in your tool belt. So too right, too yeah. right. So oh, thank you so much for our nice coffee turtle and mine, my lovely herbal tea. Um <laughs> And we've both got exciting weeks coming up. We've got a lot of, um, you know, fullness in our lives at the moment of spending time doing things that really uplift us and everything, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm super excited about our guests we have coming on later this week, too, because I think that will be a very interesting conversation, a very full conversation. And I want to hear what you guys do, too. Like, what lessons uh, have you? And we said last week we want to do a, a coffee chat tour, and you guys all responded oh. positively. That'd be so much fun. So let's make that happen eventually when we can. But in the meantime, since we're, we have a virtual coffee table with all with everybody watching, let us know your thoughts. Like, what have you transmuted in your life? How do you meditate? How do you course correct? Have you mastered the ability to catch your emotions before they become out of hand? um let us know i want to hear i want to hear from you too because that's why we have this channel is not for us to preach but for us to learn so yeah and learning from other people's approaches is so so important this is what i love most about the comments that we see below because people are so helpful and they will literally say well this worked for me or this didn't work for me and it's really it's really healing isn't it sometimes yeah. to put that down but also everyone who's sharing what has and hasn't worked for them that is a direct benefit there will be someone in that chat that needs to know that probably us yeah <laughs> um but you know it is really really important so we really appreciate anyone who takes the time to do that and takes the time to watch it and until our next coffee chat thank you all so much bye, bye.